Today we have the pleasure of welcoming Chris McKinney, the author of many novels, including The Tattoo, The Queen of Tears, Bolohead Roll, Mililani Malka, Boy No Good, Yakudoshi Age of Calamity, and the Water City Sci-Fi Trilogy. He is the recipient of several awards, including the Elia Cates Award for Literature, many Kapalapala Po'okela Awards, and the Honolulu Magazine's Author of the Year Award for his Water City Trilogy. The first book of his trilogy, Midnight Water City, was the best mystery of 2021 by Publishers Weekly. He teaches at Honolulu Community College. Chris McKinney gives us insight when writing in various genres, shares his dedication to daily writing, and emphasizes the importance of characters and setting when creating a story. He also reminds us of the importance of research and discipline in the writing process. Join us in a space for creativity. Welcome to the Reading Room. Um, your stories, you know, have situations and events, of course, set in Hawaii, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And recently, um, sci-fi with your mm -hmm. uh, Water City uh, collection. How would you describe your work, and what do you write about? It's uh, you know, like as far as describing my work, it's almost, um, almost. I'd have to think about it in terms of what period of my life did I write it, right? Because I've been doing this for twenty-five years, yeah. I guess now, twenty-five, twenty-six years. And I would say that um, early on, like a lot of writers, a lot of the stuff that I wrote was semi-autobiographical. Um, the thing with that that's funny is that if you want a sort of a sustained writing career, you're gonna you're gonna blow all of that in two, three books at the most, right? So it's just sort of like um, I knew that I was at a point um, when I hit about my fifth book that I had to do something completely out of my comfort zone, create characters that are nothing like me. Um, and so the first time I did that was Boy No Good, which was my fifth, fifth novel. Um, and then I, I found that later, it's sort of like, now it's dependent on what I happen to be interested in or reading at the time. And with the sci-fi stuff, it wasn't just me reading sci-fi, but it was um, reading stuff on um, neuroscience, uh, weirdly reading stuff on uh, underwater architecture um, and also uh, a big thing that um, I saw happening and because it's also influenced by just things that are sort of going on around you um, the TMT controversy right so it's just sort of like oh I, because these are things that I'm constantly thinking about uh, I should use that and sort of build a novel around those ideas that um, and that's, yeah, so that's sort of the way I would describe it. Wow. You know, yeah, there's so many influences, which is great because your writing is so rich, you know. Mm. Is there, like, a, a way that you keep your own voice um, while being influenced by other writers? Yeah, I mean, to me, the voice is, that's the thing you find early on, right? So it's just, you know, when I wrote the first one, The Tattoo, I knew I had a voice there, and I knew I had, I, I knew that it was, it was distinct. And once you get it, I don't think you really lose it. So that's never really part of a, um, a problem uh, with the process with me. I'm, I'm kind of confident voice-wise. There, there are other things that uh, are difficult for me, but that one, I, I, yeah. Oh, great. And you know, there's so many memorable scenes from your novels. Uh, do you have a favorite novel? And uh, if so, why is that work your favorite? <laughs> I'll just, I'll give the cliche answer. The last one I wrote is my favorite. Mm -hmm. But also I would say that this, so this is my last one. Mm -hmm. um, and this one came out in December. Mm -hmm. And it was the most fun to write because what I've been doing with the sci-fi novels is I've been playing around conceptually with the idea of fusion. And not just fusion with multiple cultures, but fusion when it comes to genre. So, for example, if you look at the first book in the trilogy, um, it's sci-fi, it's speculative, it, it's also a murder mystery. So, and then the second one is very much sci-fi, adventure, horror. So I'm playing with mixing genres. And then this one actually is post-apocalyptic fantasy. So, yeah. So, and 
I think it's because of the Hawaii thing, right? It's, it's sort of like, I don't know if I could have articulated this maybe 10 years ago, but be, I'm clearly deeply influenced by this place. I was born and raised here. And you look around and it, you start thinking everything's fusion. Everything around you is fusion, right? And it's sort of, whereas when you um, look at fiction, um, things tend to be very spe specifically and narrowly categorized. So yeah. like, but that's not really me. Mm -hmm. I wanted to try to do this thing. And, and I know the risk of it, right? <laughs> so, you know, people who love to read, for example, murder mysteries, murder mysteries, just give me murder mysteries. It's like going to a, you know, a Jap, uh, Japanese restaurant and I just want the nigiri sushi. I don't <laughs> give me all these weird rolls or all of that yeah. kind of stuff. So I know that, you know, there's, there's certain, um, people, certain, you know, portions of the audience that are like that. I'm like that with certain things too, right? I'm a purist with certain things, but it's, it was an interesting challenge. And if you're going to spend a year, a year and a half, two years on something and just killing yourself, you, you, you have to find what you're doing interesting. Yeah. Right? You're, just, you're not going to be able to complete it. Wow, you know, that, that's a lot of uh, good points because I, I can hear that there's a lot of risk taking, you yeah. know, that I, you know, I know like a lot of um, authors mentioned that you need to take risks, otherwise yeah. it gets, you know, it's not original, it's, it's yeah. hard, you know, yeah. without taking that risk. Well, that's, I mean, that's sort of, I've always had sort of the outlet of screenwriting too, right? So, you know, I'd been hired by producers to sort of write things for them. And then that's fun in a way too, because it's sort of like, it's, no, it's low risk and it's not even really your idea. You know, it's sort of like a, half of it is their idea. So it's just, so that's a different kind of challenge. Um, but with my, my fiction, yeah, there's definitely the, the risk part needs to be there. Wow, have you ever um, changed, um, like you, you have a great book and have you ever made it into a screenplay or a, like a... It's one time. Oh. So, and it was, um, so somebody bought the rights for my is it seventh, yeah, seventh book, um, Yakudoshi, Age of Calamity, and um, paid me to write it into a limited series. So I cut up the book into six episodes, wrote six teleplays. So I did all of that. And then um, I even sort of signed on as a producer for it. Mm. And then the next thing I know, we're meeting with people like Justin Chan, Sung Kang. We met with like Constance Wu in LA and I'm flying to LA back and forth and stuff like that. But my experience has been is that I've gotten close maybe three times, but then it all blows up. And then so, yeah, and that's kind of a big reason why I also went to the sci-fi was because I got caught up in that. I was like, I'm over this. I'm over doing, you know, chasing this thing for a year, two years, and then just nothing happening. Mm -hmm. um, so in a way, you know, we talked about risk earlier. In a way, this is also safer for me. Oh, I um, yeah. uh, novel writing, yeah. Wow. You know, well, what if, I, I know, I know, you know, we're talking about different types of um, genres, different types of uh, writing. Uh, what advice do you have for someone who, uh, who wants to be a novelist versus a screen screenwriter uh -huh. or, yeah? Being just a screenwriter, that's hard. So it's sort of like you, uh, because now what you're talking about is you're, you're talking about writing something. And let's say, because you're young, you haven't built a body of work yet it would be very rare for some for you to write a screenplay now now who do you send it to mm, you know you're gonna yeah. send it it's it's just it's such a tougher road because it just it costs way more money to make a film than it does to publish a novel yeah. so I, yeah I wouldn't even know how to go about it that mm -hmm. way so for me it was about building sort of a reputation as a novelist and that's where the sort of screenwriting opportunities yeah. um, came I would say if you were just going to jump into screenwriting, maybe think of yourself more as a filmmaker than a screenwriter. Learn all of it because maybe it might come down to you working with a very small budget and trying to sort of create your own project. Mm. So learn the camera, learn sound, learn all the learn direction, mm. acting, yeah. all of it. Yeah. So, so and then there's opportunity, I think. Yeah. Um, but to just say I'm just a screenwriter, that's tough. Yeah, that, that's good advice because I yeah, there's a lot of local uh, filmmakers yeah. and you know and um, yeah, and I know what you mentioned earlier where you have like novelists as your as yourself uh, who yeah. then uh, find a way to 
transform their novel to yeah. screenwriting and yeah. yeah and have have those techniques and talents used. Yeah. yeah. And then as far as advice to people who want to write novels, I mean my advice would be to and this was sort of like in my day, you know, I've talked about this a, a few times where it, it was a weird time in a way because literary fiction was the thing that you were supposed to be writing. So you know, you go to grad school, you go do an MA, MFA or whatever. And it's sort of like, no, no, we don't want to see anything that really smells of genre at all. Mm -hmm. And my advice to a writer now, young writer now, is no, be very aware of um, genre. And if you like genre, embrace genre and embrace the genre that you want. Because um, as we get further and further along technologically, I, I find that audiences get more tribal. Mm, yeah. So there isn't this universal audience. You know, back in the 90s, you could argue that there kind of was, right? It's sort of like, I don't know, Seinfeld was the most successful sitcom. Everybody yeah. watched, you know. Yeah. <laughs> not, True. Not everybody, but a, was, uh, there was this huge quote-unquote general public that watched it. I don't think that that's really, that it doesn't exist that way mm -hmm. anymore. It's just, you know, people who are into, for example, science fiction, I mean, they're, mm, they're into science fiction or fantasy or, and... So, and I don't, I'm by no means dissuading anybody from trying to write literary fiction, but um, I would say if you like genre, embrace genre yeah. and go with the one that you like the most and give it a shot. Oh, yeah, good, good advice. And, you know, if, if you don't mind, could, could yeah. you read some of your wonderful work? Sure, sure. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, yeah. So this is from my latest, this is book three in the trilogy. Um, mm. It's called Sunset Water City. And... You know what I just I just realized? Uh -huh. I forgot my reading glasses. Oh. <laughs> so this will be so sorry if this looks weird. It's, it's okay. going to be like this. But. That's all right. Okay. Uh, and this is, this is the opening. Um, uh, one, the girl. It's Patch Tuesday. Oka'asan's weekly system update. And the legless gardeners inch their wheelchairs forward with their minds. Must not use arms, they tell one another in thought talk. Soon they find find out. Soon they'll find out who will get promoted and forfeit their arms for Oka'asan too. If they pass, it won't be long before they purr the same must not use of their torsos, necks, lips, and then tongues. Flies buzz around the blotted gauze that swaddles fresh stumps. It's a hot day in Epcot, Florida, and the amputees sweat under the shadowed fig fingers of overgrown trees. I turn up my black. Foam fits cooling system. The humidity here reminds me of Water City, but it's been years since I've been. Travel there and between continents became restricted back in patch V54552, V4552, two years after Satori Day. The day that Akita Kimura broke into the minds of billions and took up permanent residence. The passage of time, now marked by past patch de designations, Version number followed by the size of the update and year has moved slowly for me over the last 10 years and the inability to travel to other places has not been helpful. My father thinks Oka'asan's Oka got every continent on its own secret mission. I wonder what these missions on other continents are. Do the gardeners function as they do here? Are they commanded to participate in self-mutilation provide never-ending sacrifices to a technological god? I hope not. Here at Epcot, the mission is not secret, at least not to us. Oka'asan is training the next generation of astronauts who will sling across Ameno Ukihashi, the largest man-made structure Earth has ever seen. The launch loop is a buzzing tubular ramp that slopes across the Gulf of Mexico some 50 miles into the sky and shoots astronauts throughout the solar system. My father and I call it Dragon Spine because it resembles the bones of a 1,200 mile long serpent pulled from the depths of the ocean and hung like a trophy far above the clouds. The gardeners prefer Oka'asan's designation, Ame no Ukihashi, or A496. During the training phase, promotion is earned when one retains sanity after losing one body part. Once they prove themselves, they lose another. This goes on until their minds are completely separated from their bodies, marking them ready for deep space travel. The first class is somewhere up there dip deep in the celestial ink. The second class has been stored uh, at Corpus Akita, Texas. 
Of course, having no body makes deep space travel much easier. No longer hindered by flesh that requires food, water, and oxygen, they are reduced to IEs that can survive extreme temperatures and sustain high gravitational force equivalent. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah. so detailed. I can vividly see that um, time period, yeah. you know. But yeah. it's, it's amazing, though. It's, it's futuristic, but yet it's relatable in uh, a way. Yeah, I'm yeah. glad. Yeah. yeah. One of the things that I, I find that, and this might be a good thing, it might actually be a bad thing, too, that I can't also, I can't be engaged for that long if there is not some kind of something darkly humorous going on. It's sort of if I I can't not laugh for a year mm -hmm. writing you know and writing a first draft. Yeah. So you know some of it is definitely it's over the top. It's a little mm -hmm. bit, you know, crazy. Even if I you know I've done research on what's possible and what's not possible, mm -hmm. I'll make it impossible just because yeah. it's funnier to me, or I'll make it um, impossible because it's in a sort of satirical way, because that's there are people out there who you know believe in the you know and it's just weird and yeah. it's sort of like more so now it feels like than mm -hmm. 50 years ago without sort of all of the stuff that we have now so it's just yeah, yeah. Wow. it's influenced by sort of all of that stuff yeah. the sound you know I, I love uh, what you mentioned about the humor yeah. and you know because I, I think especially when you have something that's dystopian you know yeah. just to yeah I mean, we, yeah. we need that you yeah know, to, you I mean know. it's like 1984 right oh. I mean that what a it I mean <laughs> it's not like as if you're busting out. It's not. It's not funny. It's scary, right? <laughs> but it's it's funny too. Yeah. It is. It's yeah. a very. I mean, it's just ooh, you know, darkly funny. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, you know, I'm a fan of that kind of stuff. So I try to, I try to include that in oh, my nice. narratives. Yeah. So great. Um, now I know you have various topics. You know, with, I know you have like all of these ten novels, yeah. and you know, and the the topics range, you know, from like abuse, you know, crime, mm -hmm. homelessness, um, dystopian futures. Mm -hmm. are, are there any topics that you would not write about? No. Well, yeah, it's just there's nothing that I can say now that I wouldn't write about. Mm -hmm. I would just say that I would have to be very much interested in that thing in order to write about it. Oh, I see. So. There might be things that I won't write about right now, but who knows in the future. I, I like yeah. how you mentioned that there needs to be an interest or like a, you need to be vested into yeah. it. Yeah, it's not like, oh, I'm just going to write this. And on this topic, it's like you have to be like into what you're writing. Absolutely, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's great. Um, now, we talk a lot about writing, especially um, I know you're an educator. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, um, I was wondering if you could describe your writing process uh, and, um, you know, how do you write, like, if a student were to ask you, I want to write a novel, like, how do I go about writing it? Like, well, what is your process? Um, okay, I said my process starts with idea. And idea is um, rooted in setting and main character. Mm -hmm. So I really don't have an idea until I have a setting and main character. Which comes first? Usually I would say main character comes first, setting, because it's sort of like you develop a character in your head, you kind of know where that character is from, right? So, and then you sort of, but I need both of those things before I start writing. And then once I have them, and I feel that I care about those two things enough, then the writing process is just very disciplined. So it's, um, and this has been, this is how I've done it for years and years now. It's sort of my daughter, you know, my first it was just one daughter, now it's two daughters. They go to school, I start writing. Um, so I wake up really early. So you know like the school stuff, correcting papers and all of that. You know, I'll do a lot of that. I'll do really early in the morning, oh, five in the morning, kind of. You know, so so I'll be able to sort of bang that out, or at least most of it out before the kids go to school. Kids go to school, then I write, and then and it's the pretty much the same time every day, about eight thirty, um, and it, I do it for about two or three hours every weekday. Weekends I don't really write, and yeah. And then next thing you know, you know, six months to a year in, you have a draft of a novel. If you just do the arithmetic, right? Wow. Yeah. That's so amazing because I know like a lot of times uh, writers are like, oh, I don't have time to write. Or, but yeah. it's like you make time every, yeah. every day. Every well, it's day. like going to the gym or something, right? It's just sort of like you can, you know, you can say, oh, you know, I got I to gotta get in shape or, or whatever. And it's just sort of what you have to understand is in order to actually do it, there's no weeks off. There's no. It's a. Mm -hmm. It's a discipline, mm -hmm. and I. I think that it's near impossible to do something like this without that. Do, do you? Uh, 
like I know some authors they sketch it out or they yeah. have kind of like a skeleton of a plot. Do, do you do that before you write or do you completely follow your characters? That's that's changed over the years. So I think you know when I first started I, I you know for obvious reasons I wasn't as confident. So um, for the first handful of books I would say that I pretty much had the first two-thirds of the story kind of outlined. Um, not in real specific detail, but I, I kind of knew what was going to happen in the first at least two-thirds of, of the story. Um, since then, I've been able to, if you, if you give me a setting, you give me main character, I can just make it up as I go along. Um, you get so, yeah, so used to the rhythms of storytelling that it's just, it becomes easier. Not easy, certainly not easy, but easier than it was at, in the beginning. Yeah. Have, have you ever had a situation where you you decided something along the plot and then you needed to go back and like... Totally. <laughs> I've totally unraveled. You know, it's sort of like you, you're creating this story and then you do something that you didn't think you were going to do. And what it does is you pull on that thread and all of these other threads before that point in the story get tangled. So. So now you got to go to page one and fix it, fix it, fix it, fix it, fix it, all the way up to the point that you came up with that idea. So that's happened. Wow. So, so do you um, reach the end of the novel before you do that? Or do you start, like, when you notice that thread being pulled, do you start going for the I can't. I get, you know, I just, no, no, I can't, I can't just leave it like that. Yeah, there's no, yeah, so I have to go back and, oh, I see. Uh, and fix it, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and, you know, we talked about the various settings and mm -hmm. you mentioned so about your creative process with setting. Uh, you have like Halava Prison and the tattoo, yeah. right? And you have uh, the year, um, uh, let's see, 2142 in uh, your <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Midnight Water City work. Uh, what do you, and I know you touched on this earlier, what advice do you have for authors in regards to research in order to have authenticity in your creative work? Uh, my advice would be to see it as necessary. Um, so it's so if you go early on with with the tattoo, I I went I knew I had friends who were CEOs there, so I was, I spent time in Halava. So every detail that you see in that book about Halava Prison, that's authentic details. That's you know these are things that you know I'm over there taking notes and stuff like that um, when I'm when I'm there. Um, I do create you know be very inattentive about it to the point where in Boy No Good um, the uh, Mor Mormon temple in Laie shows up. I'll drive to, oh, you know, yeah, sure. Laie and just sit there and just mm. look at it and take notes and all of that because I want to get it right, especially if it's a real world place. Mm -hmm. um, with this stuff, the research is also necessary, but it's just very different mm -hmm. um, because you are world building essentially. But as far as um, what's going on technologically, it, I think it's important to understand it. Mm -hmm. um, so the research was very sort of science-driven research. Um, and it's weird too, it's, it's sort of like learning a foreign language in a way, for, and then you just kind of forget it after a while. So a lot of the research I did, for, especially for the first book, I probably forgot like half the stuff that I read about, I've been reading books about stuff, but weird stuff too, like active structures. Uh, I, you know, in this thing, I men mentioned the launch loop. So the, the dimensions of the launch loop are correct. That's how a launch loop that was operational. That's how high it would have to be, et cetera, et cetera all of that kind of stuff. So it's just, yeah. So whether you're doing realistic um, fiction or sci-fi or even fantasy, I think that, you know, research mm. is essential. Wow. So for like sci-fi especially, do you do a lot of your research beforehand, like before you start the novel? Yeah, um, but some during too, because it's just sort of, you know, you hit something and wait a minute. I don't know if I've really read enough about this thing yet. So then, yeah, sometimes I, I would, I'll go back and do more additional research. Wow. And, and I know, you know, you're... <laughs> You, you wrote so many, like like we mentioned earlier, like 10 novels, right? Yeah. And I know like sometimes, you know, even like, you know, someone as talented <laughs> as no. you are, no. you know, um, I know some authors, they're, you know, afraid of writer's block or, mm -hmm. you know, or um, some uh, new writers, they're concerned about it. Uh, do you have a cure of, um, for writer's block or what are your thoughts about that? So for me, I don't, I don't really, my, my form of writer's block is when I don't have an idea. So, and... I happen to be in in one of those ruts, I guess now. So I I have time to write something right now. I just have no idea what I want to write about. I don't have I don't have a main character. I don't have a setting. 
um, I know that I, you know, I just went to Tokyo with my family, and I find myself right now reading a lot about Japan and and Jen. I, you know, I've, I've here I've always done this, but I, I feel like I'm stepping it up even more now because I've always been fascinated with Japan. I'm part Japanese, all of that stuff. So um, I don't know if that'll lead to anything, mm -hmm. but maybe. But right now, blocked. Like, and so. But once I have the idea and start, there's not really block mm -hmm. uh, because there's the discipline. So I'm, what else am I going to do with that, those two to three hours every week to, mm -hmm. but push forward? And if I absolutely can't on some days, I'll go back to the beginning of the thing or a chapter and I'll revise, I'll edit. Yeah. Um, so I guess that, that's, what, uh, that's my method for combating that kind of writer's block would be. Oh, that's so great because I know like some um, people who do have writer's block, then the panic sets in. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, but you know, yeah. that, that's, you know, uh, good thoughts that you have where it's just like it, it'll come and in a, in a certain form. And you yeah. know, it's just so like, yeah. oh, I'll work on this for now and uh, I'll work on this other project. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's sort of like I just need to be using that time oh, on cool. writing. And you know, writing is just, it's more than just pushing the story forward, of course. Mm -hmm. It's revision, it's editing, it's all of that kind of stuff, oh, yeah. Good points. Um, also, now, as you know, you're an award-winning author, <laughs> and a lot of people discuss your work. You know, I know the tattoo and, you know, a yeah. lot of novels are popular in classrooms. Uh, think of a time before all of the publications. Uh, what advice do you have anyone? I know you mentioned this earlier, um, but like if someone says, I want to be a writer, mm -hmm. you know, uh, what do you, advice you have for writers, but also um, book publication and mm -hmm. getting their work out there? I, I would say the, the fundamental question you want to ask yourself before you um, go down that path is, can you help yourself? So if you, if you can help yourself, if you cannot write, you're not really a writer. Don't try to be one. Um, writers tend to be people who can't help themselves. Um, and sometimes, sometimes that lasts for a book, sometimes two, and then it's gone. And that's why you see there are a number of, you know, a ton of writers who've written one book or two books, and and, yeah. stuff. and that's fine. That's great. Yeah. Um, but when you're first starting, if you can help yourself, don't don't do it. Um, only do it if you can't help yourself. Then if you can't help yourself, then embrace it. And um, all I, the, as far as the advice, write the thing first, mm -hmm. make it as good as possible, because nobody. Nobody wants a broken thing, mm, right? Yeah. You're gonna trade because this is you. You're really trying. You're trying to sell something. Yeah. Do you want to buy a broken thing? Mm. Nobody's gonna really want to buy a broken yeah. thing. So you have to make the book um, as fit as possible, um, and then yeah, and then you go you query agents. Um, it's really helpful. I mean, it's and it still is. It's not as important as it was back in the day. But if you live in New York, that's really helpful. Oh. Meeting people is helpful. Mm -hmm. It's sort of, you know, over the years I've met people, but it's taken me way longer mm -hmm. than it would have if I had just moved to New York. You know, when I was like 25, I would have known probably th three times as many people just because this is kind of, you know, mm -hmm. it's not just a, uh, an email online thing. I mean, meeting people in person and stuff is probably very helpful. Yeah. So yeah, so, and if you, if you make your piece as well as you can and you believe in it, just try not to get discouraged. You, everybody can sort of look up the horror stories of almost every successful writer. I mean, there's certainly exceptions, but you know, the horror stories of J.K. Rowling, you know, just sort of like 30 rejections or whatever, all of that. It's just, yeah, that's just part of it. Mm, I yeah. see. Yeah, so anyway, um, very interesting. You know, thank you so much for all of the wisdom that you've given us for the oh, reading room. For I know a lot you. of us, you know, really appreciate it, especially beginning writers. But yeah. thank you so much for joining us in the reading room. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm honored to be here. Thank you. <gasps> and thank you, everyone, for joining us in the reading room. And we look forward to seeing you in another episode. Thanks.